Welcome everyone. Uh, I can see that there is already 120 participants, so perhaps we can start. And uh, I am very glad to open today's webinar. It is the second webinar from Evidence Prime. And today we will focus on the topic of great methodology. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the rules of Zoom. Uh, the meeting is recorded and the video recording will be available and sent to you after the webinar. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions at any time in the Q&A uh, section. Uh, we will address them at the end of the presentation or at the end of webinar. And if there will be not enough time to answer all the questions, uh, we will distribute an article uh, answering all of them after the event. Uh, if you have any technical problems, raise your hands or contact us in the chat or at webinars at evidenceprime.com. And after the webinar, we will also send you the evaluation questionnaire. And uh, we would really appreciate if you fill it in because it will help us to uh, improve our future events and create more interesting webinars. Uh, so today we will have two presentations. Uh, first of all, we will talk about uh, GRADE methodology and the reasons to start using GRADE for your guideline recommendations. And second, uh, we will talk a bit about the GRADE Pro tool and how it can help you to create guidelines according to the best practices of GRADE. Uh, we have a pleasure to uh, welcome our guest speaker today, Holger Schoenemann. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact and Medicine at McMaster University, which is widely considered to be a birthplace of uh, evidence-based healthcare and problem-based learning. Uh, he's also a director of Cochrane Canada, co-chair of Great Working Group and co-director of the WHO uh, Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases Research Methods and Recommendations. He is an author of over 700 publications, and he is among 500 most cited scientists globally. So, a huge pleasure to welcome you today on our webinar. Uh, the second presentation uh, will be from our colleague Justyna Litinska, who is a junior product manager at Evidence Prime, and uh, she provides support to users of Grade Pro and takes part in the constant improvement of, of its features. Uh, she will talk more about the tool today. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we will also have Bart Dietl with us, who is the head of product development. Uh, and he will help us with answering all the burning questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please write them down. I will pass the voice, give the floor to you, Holger, right now. Thanks so much, Claudia, for the introduction. I'm going to start sharing my screen and we'll just look for um, your confirmation that you can actually see that. Yeah, OK, great. Yes, perfect. OK, super. And I keep my video on, um, should be okay. So great pleasure to be here. Thanks for the introduction, kind introduction, and um, um, great to, to, to be here. Um, I'm just gonna um, tell you uh, uh, where I'm calling from or where I'm based um, rather. So McMaster University, um, as Claudia, Claudia already mentioned, Canada, we are located in Canada, beautiful Hamilton, I'm close to Niagara Falls and um, 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 close to Toronto. This is also where the GIN International Conference um, will take place in September, um, where there will be lots of stuff about great, obviously, and a lot about guidelines and systematic reviews. A um, few con um, disclosures. I don't have any direct um, financial conflicts of interest here. Um, as Claudia already mentioned, um, um, I'm co-chair of the Great Working Group um, that um, has produced um, Great Pro, which is Great's official app. Um, and a few of the other things, um, I want to acknowledge some funders some of work that I will be briefly citing, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the World Health Organization. The views um, here um, that I'm going to express on my own, um, despite the fact that um, I obviously have some roles with the great working group and these organizations. So for this webinar, um, for these 30 minutes, um, this is um, a bit of a 
um, polished up version of a webinar that um, um, I, I did for the McRae Center um, that I directed McMaster. Um, this webinar should be informative for people who are new to GRADE or organizations that are considering the use of GRADE. And um, it very much talks about um, what is the title of the presentation, and that is the uh, 15 reasons that um, I came up with for using GRADE. The objectives are to provide an ever so brief background um, on GRADE and then why systematic review authors and particular guide on developers may want to use the GRADE approach. And um, 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 I, I think uh, um, that um, um, this could be, again, quite useful for those of you who are um, involved in GRADE already, um, and in particular, those who are totally familiar with everything that I'm going to talk about. Um, what I will ask um, you to do, perhaps, is to think about how you would present the information um, differently and, and send me an email and give me some feedback. Thanks for that um, already. So um, um, just to start with, this is my general intro slide about guidelines. What characterizes a trustworthy guideline recommendation should be based on systematic reviews of the best available evidence. Um, um, they should be produced by a multidisciplinary panel, so in other words, a diverse group, should be considering people's values, in particular when it comes to the outcomes, should include ratings of the certainty of the evidence and the strength of the recommendation, be up to date or revised as appropriate when new evidence um, warrants modifications of a recommendation, and obviously should minimize distortions, biases, um, and conflicts of interest certainly lead to biases. And then um, also in terms of general intro, um, as we all know when we formulate health recommendations, what we are typically interested in is um, um, what um, um, do interventions or options that we are considering do for the health benefits and the health harms. In other words, do the benefits outweigh the harms? And in reality, um, what we are considering, and this is so relevant for GRADE, um, there's lots of other factors that influence a recommendation and a decision. Um, obviously, this is in part to do with costs and feasibility issues and how, as I already said, important the outcomes are. Um, also, in terms of grades, we are asking typically two questions. One is then, after considering that, whether or not the desirable um, consequences outweigh the undesirable consequences and if we are sure about it, and that is typically reflected in a recommendation, this is from the tuberculosis rec map here, typically reflected in a or described um, um, in a recommendation by describing the certainty in the evidence or of the evidence and um, um, indicating the strength of the recommendation. And most of you are totally familiar with that, and I will not go into the greatest detail about that. So um, just in terms of GRADE and as a background, um, GRADE has um, set out over 20 years ago now to provide a unifying, transparent, and sensible system for grading the certainty of evidence and making decisions. Um, grateful that you will hear about is um, the app that we've developed as part of this enterprise. Um, then um, many organizations have participated and are using GRADE. Um, literally over 100 um, help develop it and are using it. There's um, um, over 1,000 members of the GRADE working group or approximately 1,000 members of the GRADE working group. Um, GRADE is for systematic reviews, health technology assessments, and guidelines. At a minimum, there is literally thousands of recommendations that have been formulated using GRADE. There's over 80,000 citations to our publications, and probably that number is larger, always difficult to count. We are producing guidance articles and concept articles as the GRADE working group. These are official GRADE publications, and they do what the name describes here, concept articles um, um, describing new or existing concepts that may lead to guidance um, that have to do with um, the primary focus of GRADE, and that is rating the certainty and developing recommendations. And then there is a, um, a little bit of an advertisement for those if you're interested, not official GRADE papers, but GRADE notes published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology that deal with um, um, challenges that you might encounter in the application of GRADE for which you might have ad hoc solutions and similar things. Um, and the JC is very interested in that. We've published the, wor the, the work widely, um, including more recent work on environmental health, 
um, in environmental health international. There's also the great handbook, and as I already mentioned, the great app. Um, um, I, um, in terms of um, GRADE, I want to provide you with a brief overview where GRADE actually fits in. This is the conceptual overview of developing recommendations um, that includes many, many things, including organization, training, conflicts of interest considerations, some transparency and documentation of the process, group processes and who is involved, um, from priority setting to updating, including all the nuances around GRADE. Um, and um, 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 it's important when you create trustworthy guidelines to obviously follow these processes. Great, in particular, fits in, in my view at least, um, with um, what is here part of this frame. And that is some um, helping a guideline development group um, going from a PICO question to um, developing a recommendation. And we've done work obviously on dissemination and implementation. And in a nutshell, this is um, what most of you are familiar with. This is how it looks. A guideline development group or a panel formulates typically a PICO question, um, a systematic review or HTA employing systematic review methods um, will um, evaluate some um, single research um, studies and um, focus on outcomes based on the people that are either critical or important for decision-making. Um, one of ma major contributions of GRADE has been to not look at things that might really not be important for decision-making that has led to a lot of efficiency. We then produce evidence profiles or seminal findings tables, which are also development of the GRADE working group um, that synthesize the key findings for the outcomes of interest and um, include a rating of the certainty for each of the outcomes, as well as then providing information for other criteria um, that are considered in the process of going from evidence to a decision or a recommendation, provide evidence for this type of information so that a panel actually can work through in a structured way the individual criteria that may lead them to either make a recommendation for or against an intervention or an option, and that, and that recommendation can be either strong or conditional, also called weak, um, um, in order to then produce a guideline with many recommendations, sometimes some single recommendations. But that's kind of the over, overall process um, in a nutshell, and there's obviously lots of nuances. Now, I wanna focus on why one should be using GRADE. The first thing is, um, as I already mentioned, GRADE um, is the international standard. As I mentioned, it's used by over 100 organizations. And I think, um, or we think in GRADE, that that speaks for itself. Um, um, there is um, certainly nuances and it's not straightforward, but nobody promised it would be easy, number one. And number two, um, rating certainty and the whole field of evidence synthesis um, never claimed to be easier than neurosurgery or any other complicated um, um, healthcare profession. And um, therefore, you obviously need to be appropriately trained. Um, however, it's the international standard despite the, some, um, um, the nuances that are required. GRADE is a structured approach, and um, I will not say much more about it. I will just refer you back to this slide, um, which is obviously um, um, describing that structured approach for the overall process, but um, GRADE is also structured in that, for instance, the certainty of the evidence assessment follows some very specific um, domains. And um, if you talk to lay audiences, we like to phrase the questions that influence the certainty of the evidence in um, these ways. So the first question is, are the research studies well done? Um, that has to do with limitations in study design and execution or um, in proper terminology, risk of bias. The next signaling question that we asked that is also very intuitive, um, we believe, to those who are not as familiar with this particular evidence synthesis um, field, is about whether or not the results are consistent across studies when they should be consistent. In other words, inconsistency um, may influence how confident you can be in the research evidence that exists. Then um, the third question that we ask is how directly do the results relate to our question? This has to do with indirectness, the broader topic of applicability, generalizability, external validity, transferability or translatability. All these are terms 
that are captured under indirectness. In other words, they have to do with how directly does the research evidence relate to the question of interest um, when you evaluate it. Fourth is, is the effect size precise or due to random error? This is imprecision. And the fifth is whether or not this is really all of the research that has been conducted um, or is there an issue around um, publication bias, which we know has um, enormous um, impact, potential enormous impact on research results. So these are five pretty straightforward questions that um, um, and where great some contribution has been really to operationalize it. The other thing that I always emphasize here is, um, as you hear people talking about statistically significant results, once you start understanding great, you realize that imprecision is only one of many factors and there um, is more um, um, mistakes that can be introduced um, 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 through other domains as opposed to imprecision um, in many, many, for many, many questions. The sixth question that we ask has to do with, is there anything that makes us particularly certain? As you all probably know, large effects, if the worst case scenario predictors still allow for strong conclusions, and if there are exposure effect relations. Now, the nice thing, thinking about the structure, and I will say that twice today, is that these type of questions can be asked for all types of bodies of evidence, for treatment, for interventions, for tests, for prognosis, for values or the importance that people place on outcomes for prediction models, um, environmental health um, um, questions and PECO type of questions. Um, but they should be that rating should be based on an evidence synthesis from systematic reviews or health technology assessments. The third reason um, that um, we think is really, really important is um, um, whether or not um, 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 uh, um, or is that grade is actually an ethically driven approach. It considers all criteria that influence a decision. For instance, in the evidence to decision frameworks that I will return to, um, there's a question, what would be the impact on health equity? And there's a series of papers that um, describes it headed by, spearheaded by Vivian Welsh, um, that um, describes the use of equity or the consideration of equity in grade in particular. Um, also related to that is whether or not the intervention or the option is acceptable to all key stakeholders. And what I also always emphasize is I would advise you to actually look at the detailed signaling questions in the evidence to decision frameworks to understand all of what is what GRADE has thought about. Um, so for instance, um, under acceptability, we've thought of whether or not the intervention is morally um, acceptable, um, what it um, does to um, maleficence, um, beneficence, or justice, for instance. So that is explained. But that um, allows you then to do this balancing of the benefits um, and harms or all desirable and undesirable consequences. Um, I like to throw this in at the end of the day, it's about doing no net harm. So, and then the fourth reason is that GRADE is um, operationalized in great detail. And um, more than any other um, approach to developing guidelines um, or rating the certainty, we believe, um, and um, there's an excellent resource on the Cochrane training um, website with all of the great articles. There's over 50 articles that actually describe great in detail, and there's a great handbook that is integrated in great pro. Fifth, it's a comprehensive approach. I already mentioned that the signaling questions or the main domains of rating the certainty can be applied to other types of healthcare questions, those that have to do, for instance, with prognosis, values, environment, public health, network meta-analysis. There's a question in the in the chat, and um, I'm sure that Justina can can talk about uh, um, the new developments around network meta-analysis and um, the summary of findings tables for multiple interventions. But what Gray does is it brings the bodies of evidence together and makes the decision transparent. The sixth um, um, point then is related to that transparency. Um, great um, has set out and provided um, quite some detail about how to formulate questions and make these questions transparent. Um, in addition to the, to the structure, the evidence profiles and summary of findings tables, 
um, provide the transparency that is needed, including judgments that people make. So we have specific um, um, articles that uh, um, that refer to how to, for instance, explain the judgments that are necessary when rating the certainty of the evidence. There is an excellent paper by Nancy Santeso um, that has um, dealt with that in the context of evidence profiles. Um, the evidence to decision frameworks provide transparency um, how conflicts of interest can be considered in working through an evidence to decision framework by, for instance, making sure that those who have conflicts can possibly participate in the consider conversation around the research evidence, but to then, as you take the structured approach, refrain from influencing um, any of the criteria that might have an impact on the recommendation. And then um, the rationale for the evidence to recommendations is part of the evidence to decision um, criteria and frameworks, which were a result of a large project that the great working group did with partners from 2011 to 2015, um, including WHO, NICE, and many other um, partners, and um, led to a series of articles that many of you will be familiar with um, on the great evidence to decision frameworks that um, 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 several of which were spearheaded by Pablo Alonso Coelho. Coelho. Um, so uh, um, that is a good reference to that. And the evidence to decision frameworks um, are considered to be interactive in the sense that, yes, there's a series of criteria that are considered standard. Um, they should all be supported by systematic reviews. There's some confusion around that, um, but um, Great has always emphasized that for any of these criteria that are utilized, there should be an underlying systematic review, if possible, that supports any judgment um, um, after appraisal by a guideline panel. So that's quite important, and those obviously have been integrated in Great Pro, and um, um, Justina will talk more about that. The um, other um, features um, of an evidence to decision framework are beyond the criteria that I just mentioned are the details of the question, including the conflicts of interest that should be labeled there, the actual assessment and the um, judgments that are, are made on the basis of research evidence, be it randomized trials or expert evidence, the conclusions that are drawn and the presentation and implementation support, including um, um, interactive decision aids and um, the databases that exist of evidence to decision frameworks. And important is also that in these um, interactive evidence to decision frameworks, we've emphasized that the perspective that a group takes should be very clear, um, that the type of decision should be made very clear, that can be guideline recommendations, it can be for policy or coverage decisions, and um, what um, the evidence to decision frameworks really help with is the group decision making, um, which can be done in person and online, particularly with the COVID pandemic, we um, um, were um, prepared to do recommendations and guidelines in an online fashion um, because of that structure that existed and um, that obviously has been used in um, recommendations and guidelines over the past two years, uh, when um, since ever. Um, these in-person meetings have become almost infeasible, although there's obviously um, light at the end of the tunnel. So um, the, what is really important in this context is of the evidence to decision frameworks is that they are flexible in their use, so users can choose an ETB template, as I already said, um, and um, the original grade evidence to decision frameworks emphasize that a group might add custom criteria, including custom answer options, um, which is also available here in the, in the app, obviously, um, if they believe that it is necessary. So for instance, although ethics are considered under values and acceptability and equity, um, as well as feasibility, a guideline panel might say, we think that this particular topic is so sensitive to ethical considerations that we want to make this a um, special criteria. And then um, on number seven, the reason number seven is that um, GRADE can be integrated with systematic reviews and health technology assessments. As I already said, the summary of findings tables are um, obviously a Key, um, um, a key product that is integrated with um, Cochrane reviews, for instance, 
but um, um, this is also an example from HTA, UNETA. Um, um, if you look at the latest guidance from UNETA, so the European Network of Health Technology um, Assessment Agencies, um, they um, suggest using elements of grade and the grade approach, for instance, to harmonize um, evidence profiles that can then be shared across different groups. Grades recommendations are interpretable. Um, um, so, and there's a question in the chat that I can address here quickly. So one aspect relates to addressing the certainty and the underlying evidence. So for instance, the certainty that we have in an intervention effect or um, in the values that people assign to outcomes. Um, and that is one part of the work. The other part of the work relates to then balancing the desirable and undesirable consequences where the certainty of the evidence is one factor in order to arrive at a recommendation. And great um, in the recommendation context at least makes two types of recommendations, either strong recommendations or conditional recommendations. They're also called weak recommendations, but we've moved to that terminology. And um, um, the strong recommendations are typically a result of moderate or high certainty evidence. Typically, I say, when the balance of the desirable and undesirable consequences is clear. Conditional recommendations are a result of when things are not as clear. And we've provided um, interpretation aids for patients or people affected by a condition, the clinicians, um, policymakers, and researchers, what these strong recommendations mean. So for instance, when there is a strong recommendation, additional research, unless they are based on low or very low certainty evidence as an exception, um, is, is, is unlikely going to have a big impact on this recommendation, as an example. GRADE also allows for the identification of research gaps. This is from um, um, a paper um, by Ray Zhang and, and colleagues, also part of the, of the Cochrane Handbook, how rating down for one of the domains can actually be interpreted in terms of what research might be missing there, as well as guideline recommendations in the conclusion section of the ETD making um, 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 making the consideration of research priorities a very, very important um, um, topic. Um, GRADE also allows for innovation. Um, this is an idiosyncratic um, view, but obviously um, there has been a lot of work around NMA um, and multi-intervention um, or multiple intervention comparisons, um, which are a big innovation that GRADE has contributed to in sorting this out. There's work ongoing um, on um, further um, um, sorting this out, but uh, one aspect of innovation has been, for instance, our recommendation mapping um, approach, and that is um, um, based on or similar to, to evidence mapping, um, providing information to users of recommendations about um, underlying um, recommendations and provides a, a, um, 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 a um, simple tools to bring all recommendations on a topic together. For instance, here is work that we did with the WHO Global TB Department where um, recommendations were fragmented across different guidelines. Um, um, although all developed according to high standards of the WHO handbook, they were not as accessible um, uh, um, um, as they could have been. So we de developed something that was that is called the WHO tuberculosis um, rec map or the ETB guidelines for WHO that provide a um, 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 clear listing of all of the recommendations or so your key topics um, in the T in the um, in the management of TB, prevention, screening, diagnosis, treatment, and um, um, any special needs in populations. So just as a quick reminder, outside of COVID-19, TB is the infectious disease killer number one, number one in, the, in the world. And there's list views of all recommendations that people can go to and click on to understand details, as well as these heat maps um, that describes information about what is available and where there might be research gaps, although interpretation, you should read this paper, possibly go, go to that paper, um, 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 needs to be done with caution. This has been taken up by um, other organizations, such as the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health, so Canada's um, HDA um, organization, um, as well as in our 
um, um, COVID-19 um, recommendation map. Here's the link to that if you're interested in that, where we've um, actually utilized the approach from the from of the great working group to describe um, background information to individual recommendations that include the ETDs um, um, and um, include an assessment of the credibility of the guidelines. And for for instance, um, as I already mentioned, the ETDs are part of this particular recommendation map um, extracted in in this case in Great Pro and can be uploaded into these recommendation maps. These ETDs also allow for something else, which GRADE has, has facilitated in our view, and that is adaptation and adoption of guidelines. So the GRADE development framework is one of the frameworks that has been utilized to, for instance, adapt the, the um, 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 COVID-19 recommendations. And um, it's very much based on the availability and transparency of evidence to decision frameworks when they de were developed well Groups can come in and adapt recommendations, contextualize recommendations, um, for instance, those of the European Initiative or um, European Commission, Commission Initiative on Breast Cancer, those guidelines and recommendations because of the availability of ETDs could be contextualized um, to other settings and other countries and following in particular this um, great development framework. Then, um, um, and um, the use of evidence of decision frameworks also lays out the criteria that might have led to a recommendation which facilitates the development of decision aids. Um, last few slides um, before I finish, I think one of the biggest strengths of GRADE is that it is supported by an international network of GRADE centers and GRADE networks. Um, these are country-based networks where um, people in a country um, um, work together and have formed networks such as the US Great Network, which was the first one, the Dutch um, Great Network. Um, um, more recently, the Scandinavian Great Network has been, has been approved by Great is supported by networks and centers now literally on all inhabited um, continents. Great also is supported by tools. So we will talk about Great Pro and um, the publication platform, the RecMaps that I just um, described, that can be used directly to um, create recommendations. And then um, 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 finally, the um, GRADE is um, um, obviously supported by uh, um, resources to learn about GRADE, which are available um, 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 to, for your use. This is, again, a reference to the GRADE Cochrane um, website um, that includes all of the publications, links to the publications, learning modules, et cetera, et cetera. Also helpful is our great um, center website at McMaster University that has a lot of that information. But finally, finally, um, and most importantly um, to me personally is that great is educational and fun. Um, it has um, um, been an enormous privilege to work with so many wonderful individuals. This is a picture from our, um, I think it might have been the last in-person um, bigger meeting that we had in, in Hamilton. Um, the great working group holds regular meetings. Um, membership is open to all. There is no fees um, related to great membership. We hold workshops globally. Um, guideline group members, um, 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 which is another fun activity, I think, that we work with, um, at whatever the organization is, generally learn about um, research and the importance of considering evidence, um, which I think is also um, critically important. And um, GRADE has been implemented in many workshops, as I said, but also in the Jin McMaster in-guide program, which is a guideline credentialing and certification program. Um, because we believe that learning um, and the education about grade, as I said, is critical for people who develop guidelines. But I want to emphasize um, participating in grade is, um, is really great, great um, fun. So in summary, I um, provided you with um, or I talked about the 15 reasons that um, um, I so far have come up with why grade is really a, a great, great um, um, program for us and um, a great uh, um, collaborative. And um, I hope that those of you who are on, I see over 200 people on, quite amazing. 
um, who are not a member of the great work, working group um, will join us soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, Holger. This was a great presentation. And uh, we have already some questions. Um, so perhaps we can answer a few. Uh, first question is, can grade be used to assess evidence from case reports and short case series? If not, are you aware of any method we can use to assess evidence of medication efficacy in rare diseases? Yeah, great question. Excellent question, actually. So I will distinguish two things. Um, one is um, there's a few tools out there that um, have been published about assessing the quality um, of um, case reports or case series. Um, that is similar to a risk of bias tool that can be used to assess this, the quality um, term that we use of randomized trials or non-randomized um, studies. Um, with that in mind, um, assessing the risk of bias of, of then or limitations of case reports and case um, series, um, it becomes pretty obvious that um, they will be at high risk of bias and typically end up as low certain, uh, very low certainty evidence. Sorry, and um, um, so so uh, um, um, case reports and case series can be used in exactly the same. Um, the same the same way that um, other types of research can be utilized. And the other thing that might be relevant here is some uh, work that we've done around expert evidence and how to assess some um, single cases. Again, this will typically lead to lower very uh, to to very low certainty evidence, I should say. But grade is equally um, applicable there. Um, so yeah, that's. And so rare diseases, so I also refer you to some literature that we've done, happy to disseminate this later around how to use GRADE in the context of rare diseases. Uh, great. Uh, another question. Um, uh, great information about GRADE. I have a question whether GRADE can be applied to qualitative uh, systematic reviews or scoping reviews. Ah, great question. So um, um, scoping reviews. Hmm. Um, I have big problems with uh, uh, with the term scoping reviews and assessing any certainty based on that. The way that I look at uh, at scoping reviews is it basically gives you a lay of the land, um, and you shouldn't be when you are not systematic, um, unless you identify a systematic review that you find credible. Um, you shouldn't be rating the certainty in this. But qualitative evidence, absolutely, I. Um, um, I should have mentioned this probably under prognosis, and this is a great reminder um, for me to add it under that particular slide. Um, great circle is for qualitative evidence, and great circle has, in my view, made huge um, contributions to understanding um, how much trust to put in qualitative research. So um, great circle is the answer to the qualitative research, and I refer you to those publications, um, again, also available on the um, on the, um, on the uh, website that I refer to. Okay, um, another question. Uh, is it reasonable for a group uh, say that they are using great methodology if they only address the certainty of evidence on benefits and harms and do not take it to the next step of developing recommendations based on the other factors? Yeah, so I mean, it all depends on it all depends on how how the group presents it, right? But if a group says we use them um, great to assess the certainty of the evidence of our systematic reviews, and they truly did it, um, then that's perfectly fine. Now, um, they shouldn't say we use great to develop our recommendations if they didn't use great. And what I will refer you to, um, the easiest way of, of doing this is I would put this in the in the chat in a, in a second, is to go to um, um, the criteria for using great. In other words, um, we have put together a minimal set of criteria that groups um, should be following um, in order to claim that they use great. Now, I will also say great has never gone into the policing business. Um, that's not our task, right? Um, we are not going out there and say, you know, this group used great, this group didn't use great. Um, um, first of all, because we wouldn't have the resources, but um, also that's not in the spirit. I don't, I don't think it's in the spirit of great, but I will put that link in the chat in a second. Okay, perfect. Uh, and maybe one more question. Uh, have great been used in animal health research? Oh, another great question. Yes, um, indeed. Unfortunately, our 
So um, um, great. Um, so two things I think are, are relevant. One is um, great. There's a great guidance for um, animal research and um, how it um, leads to translational research. I'll um, put this out there. Yes. Um, the second um, aspect is that there is a lot of work ongoing in the environmental health uh, um, project group that um, in part deals with, for instance, uh, mechanistic evidence um, um, and how that obviously can come from in vitro and in vivo studies that include um, animal research and how to utilize that information, for instance, by informing judgments about indirectness. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, there is a lot of questions and please uh, everyone ask us uh, whatever you, you're interested in. Uh, but I think right now we could move on to the next presentation. And then at the end of the okay. webinar, we can come back to the questions and answer all the rest. Claudia, I will also try to address if that's okay with you without taking too much away from Justina's presentation. I will address a few of them in the chat if that's okay oh, with you while I'm listening. Perfect, Thanks. perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Justina. Okay, so let me show my screen. Just to make sure, so can you see my presentation? Yes. Great. Okay, thank you uh, everyone for coming. Thank you very much, Holger, for this incredibly informative uh, presentation. So now that we have learned 15 reasons on uh, how to and why to use GreatPro, I wanted to show you how uh, GreatPro can support uh, using Great with your guidelines, with your recommendations, and how it can support you following the best practices of GRADE. I want you to remember during this presentation that this is only a very short preview of GRADE Plus functionalities, of GRADE Plus possibilities. So think of it as a teaser, as a preview. And uh, at the end, I will give you um, uh, the pr provide you with the ways of contacting us in case you want to uh, ask uh, some questions. Of course, you can also ask them in the chat here. So Great Pro can support you in a number of ways. But first of all, it can set up frameworks for you so you don't have to create tables and processes from scratch. They are ready and waiting for you in a, a number of ways. Uh, there is always guidance and checklists and information available scattered throughout the whole of Great Pro. So whenever you feel lost on what to do next, you can always consult with these, uh, with these uh, advices, with these pieces of advice, and uh, learn how to what to do next. There is also a very mm, uh, a very wide uh, set of possibilities to manage your team, to uh, give your collaborators access to your data and ask them for feedback, which I will also move on to next. Uh, many processes in Great Pro are automated or semi-automatic, uh, automated, meaning that they are only a few clicks away from completion and uh, you don't need to do them manually, which saves you time and makes things easier. And finally, there is our one of our key features, the panel voice, which enables you to gather feedback from experts, from um, uh, specialists of the great domain and of the domain that you are uh, creating recommendations within with, through, the, uh, through the panel voice feature. So that was also something that I will talk about um, soon. So to start regarding the... Uh, so to start, regarding setting the frameworks, you will find that when you start working with Great Pro, already its structure reflects the guideline structure. So every project you create in Great Pro is equivalent to a guideline. And within this project, you can create questions that are equivalent to recommendations. So already here, this setting is something that is ready for you. And this is an environment that reflects the guideline structure. When you want to start your work and you are unsure on, uh, of what to do next, you can always consult with the GIN and Packmaster guideline checklist, which is available in every project by design. And this is basically a step-by-step -step approach to the guideline development process, where, it, where you have not only the descriptions of particular steps and what they should refer to, but you can also track your progress from uh, the beginning to the very end and also access various helpful resources to expand your knowledge on this subject. So this is something really helpful in the guideline development process. And as you can see on this slide, one of the very important steps is 
gathering your guideline group, gathering your collaborators. And for that, Great Pro has a dedicated um, dedicated part, the dedicated uh, feature for membership for the team management. So you can add a number of uh, collaborators and number of participants who you can provide with various levels of access depending on the role in your project. So you don't have to worry that if uh, someone is given access to um, elements of the project they should not or need not to uh, access. There is also the option to mark people for panel participation. Uh, it means that they will be sent various forms uh, through emails and this way they can provide feedback to your uh, to your work in uh, many of great pro features what is even better here is that for this part great pro account is not required so you can uh, you can ask um, specialists for feedback but you don't you don't have to ask them to go through great pro training they simply go go to the forms that are sent via email and they, they can provide you um, feedback so that is uh, that makes it easier for both for you and for them. You can also manage the conflict of interest there. So this is something really important in terms of transparency, uh, which is required by GRADE. So you are provided with a number of various forms of uh, conflict of interest, and uh, they follow the um, schematics used by uh, various organizations around the world, including WHO. You can follow who of your team members already completed the form and who hasn't with the color coded banners and uh, then you can then you can uh, draw conclusions from these how to how to draw these conclusions it is very simple the users uh, the members um, fill in the forms that are sent via email with their details and once the forms are filled in you can act, you can either preview them uh, in the um, in the project and after you preview them and you see the content you can mark whether or not that person is conflicted with this this particular question or questions when someone is marked as conflicted they are automatically excluded from the forms that are sent regarding this particular question so great pro covers that for you it follows whether or not someone has conflict of interest and it helps you stay transparent and um, according to the best best standards regarding the work itself as i mentioned a great pro sets up frameworks for you and it said and uh, it provides you with a number of uh, tables that are ready to fill in by you so the they we have uh, two versions of great evidence tables and three versions of summary of findings tables uh, according to the cochrane standards and apart from that there is also the interactive summary of findings table which, as its name suggests, is design, designed for the user interaction. So it also has elements which are helpful when presenting the results to the wider public. So, for example, plain language statements which allow you to, uh, which allow you to put it in words that are simpler to understand by uh, people who are not uh, specialists of great or uh, the domain that you create your recommendations with. Regarding automation that I mentioned. Uh, the certainty assessment in Great Pro is uh, almost fully automatic, meaning that you only need to enter um, enter the judgments for particular criteria of certainty assessment, so risk of bias and inconsistency, and so on. Once you enter all of them, the overall certainty is calculated by Great Pro, so you don't have to wonder what it should be. It is calculated and it follows the grade rules, so you can be certain of that. If you are unsure of how to assess a particular criterion, you can always refer to the uh, helpful tips in Great Pro added to every part of the evidence table, where you can refer to the great guidance regarding this particular criteri criterion and learn more about what you are actually assessing. There are also tools that uh, help the assessment of, uh, for example, risk of bias. So you are presented with a table where you uh, when you answer auxiliary questions, uh, auxiliary criteria, and with these, it is more helpful for you to um, judge the overall um, certainty, the overall overall risk of bias uh, for for this um, for this particular outcome. Similar tool is available for indirectness. So again, this is a table where you can answer auxiliary questions, and with these, you can. Um, you can uh, decide on the final uh, judgment for indirectness. Similar tools are also available in the evidence 
to decision table that Hogger mentioned. So every criterion has the detailed judgments option, which also is a table where you can answer auxiliary questions and this way reach the final judgment for this particular criterion. So great for helps you with that. Uh, however, the judgments are not are, may not be only uh, made by you. You can also ask the panel of experts for help. And this is where the panel voice feature comes in pretty handy. So what it means very shortly is that you enter the results into the evidence decision table, and then you can send these for judgment to a panel of panel of members, panel of specialists who can provide their feedback. This feedback, these answers are then presented to you, summarized in Great Pro, and you can either send them again if there are any doubts, if there is uh, no consensus between the members, and you can repeat this or you can do it just once if there if everything is straightforward and then with these results you can draw your conclusions and form a recommendation so this this works uh, in a very simple way the panel members are sent uh, forms which reflect the evidence decision table and they can provide their answers their judgments and their comments if applicable if they want to add some more information from their part and then you see these judgments summarized in grade pro so we can have this even by numbers or by percentages whichever is more clear to you at that part and you can see what is the overall opinion of the panel on this particular question there is also the possibility to do this in a narrowed down way so for example if you have done this already a few times and you know what is the general opinion of the panel on this you can mark the answers for yourself. Uh, you can suggest the answers and the panel will only answer whether they agree or disagree with the question. If they disagree, they will be comply they will be um, they will have to provide comment why they disagree to make sure that every every opinion is accounted for and no uh, doubts are omitted. And again, these results can be presented to you in Great Pro and you can see what is the opinion of your panel of experts. So to sum up, GoPro helps you in a number of ways. It sets up frameworks so that your project structure reflects guideline structure and tables are ready to fill in. You don't have to create them from scratch. And this way you are sure that the frameworks follow great rules because that is how they were designed in GradePro. There is always guidance available for you so you can refer to the GIN and McMaster checklist if you are not unsure of what to do next. And uh, you can always refer to explanations of great terms and rules as well as decision facilitating tools. So for example, the risk of bias tool that, that I was showing to you. You can manage your team, so give them uh, multiple levels of access and invite specialists with no great per accounts in case of panel voice, as well as manage conflicts of interest. The automation makes it uh, easier to calculate great certainty and uh, every, most of the functions are just one click away, so everything is quite simple and quick to do, which is more important when you want to uh, feel when you, when you want to meet your deadlines. And finally, the panel voice feature helps you receive feedback from experts and facilitates guideline development discussions. If you want to learn more, because I imagine that I didn't have a lot of time to do this, so you can always go to greatfor.org. There you can read, read more about the tool and create a free account, which is available for everyone. Anyone can create a free account at GreatPro and uh, play with uh, many of the features. Only some of them are available for uh, for groups or for uh, subscriptions there is also the knowledge base at uh, kb.gradepro.org so if you have any technical uh, questions about gradepro about how particular features work you can go there we are um, constantly expanding this list of articles so there will be more info there will be more information coming soon you can always write at support at evidenceprime.com so we will answer your questions if you are unsure of, uh, of what to do in great pro if you encounter any issues or sales at evidenceprime.com if you want to acquire great pro subs subscription for your team or your organization and finally you can always visit evidenceprime.com our uh, homepage of our company for more tools that we make and thank you for your attention and back to you claudia uh, thank you, Justyna. Another great presentation. Um, and we do have a lot of questions. We have a really active audience today, which is nice to nice to see. 
Uh, I've seen that uh, Holger was as answering already some questions on the chat, so we will definitely include them in the summary of the article at the end and send it to everybody. Uh, and we have a few more questions to, to our panel uh, list. Uh, first question is, uh, if there are disagreements in the outer team related to any of the domains, for example, a few members of the team feel a value is low and the rest feel it's moderate based on the evidence, how do we com come to a consensus? Uh, any standardized approach uh, can you please recommend? And I've seen that Holger would like to answer this question. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's a great, great question. So, um, um, I, there's a couple, there's a couple of ways of, of dealing with this. So we don't necessarily have a standardized approach, but one approach that we, that we, um, um, utilized, um, that is similar to systematic reviews is to use an, um, an independent arbitrator. So in other words, um, um, think of inclusion exclusion of an article in a systematic review, uh, different opinions. Um, you get a third um, senior investigator to help with um, um, resolving the, the issue. I think that is one of the approaches that we would certainly suggest. However, um, really important is the transparency appropriate. And um, most of the domains are a result of judgment, right? So I'm talking now about the certainty of evidence domain. So um, most importantly, if you encounter a scenario like this is to actually describe in a footnote that there were alternate views, for instance, whether or not to rate down for indirectness um, by those who did the rating of the certainty um, that um, you can say to arbitration, um, a third senior investigator um, um, doing, for instance, that final or um, um, providing that final judgment that um, the final decision was that, but it, that it would have been reasonable to not weigh down for indirectness because of X, Y, and Z. That is providing the transparency that we are actually that we are actually looking for, right? Um, uh, um, and addresses the issue. The other thing is um, if that's related to actual judgments about a criterion on the evidence to decision frameworks. Um, what we say is if consensus doesn't form, um, I think this question was more related to the certainty, but if consensus doesn't form, we often revert to voting um, in, order to, um, um, in order to get to a final answer on a, on a criterion on an ETD. Over. Perfect, thank you. Uh, another question is, um, can we use words and phrases such as maybe, can be in the final recommendations based on the relative strengths or weaknesses of evidence? Uh, maybe, can be. Um, um, so, um, great. And one of the papers in the series has provided some suggestions for standard wordings for the recommendations. And may is, for instance, one of the terms that we've utilized or suggested for conditional recommendations. Can is probably not very helpful. Um, there is work from, um, um, from Rick Schiffman and, and, and colleagues from quite a few years ago that talks about what phrasing to utilize in, in recommendations and GRADE has adopted many of these suggestions. So for instance, to avoid the term con to consider an option because by the time that you look at an option, you're already considering it um, and it doesn't provide the type of guidance. But um, so should is typically a word that we utilize in strong recommendations and may is typically a word that we use in conditional recommendations. Um, okay, we have some questions about how to become a great working group member. <laughs> Okay, let me put the let me put oh, and now I see that there is like a million on Q and A questions in the <laughs> in the chat as Claudia is reminding us. I will put in the in the um, in the main in the main answer. I will put sorry. I will put a few links there, including the one to the to the membership. Okay. And, and sorry, the, just very clear, very quickly. It's just subscribing to our list serve that makes you a member of the group. 
Um, you can also sign up for project uh, um, project groups, but I'm sorry, Claudia, this is actually quite important. It's um, it's just signing up with your email. That means that you get um, the emails of the great working group. Um, um, and we use that listserv extremely sparingly. In other words, we are not uh, using it in any, we believe for any unnecessary information. It basically informs you about the meetings and the project groups. And um, we try to keep it this way so that you only get them the key information. And maybe a related question, if uh, you provide any formal kind of training or certification to interested people in joining your team. Say, say that again, sorry. If you provide any kind of training or certification to the people who are interested in joining your team. Um, joining our team. So, I mean, we do training workshops for grade. We do, the grade working group does. We do have the training program for InGuide that includes grade. Um, in, in terms of joining our team, it's often learning by doing. We have a set of resources. If somebody is interested in working with us on a, on a guideline that we, that we provide, and then we typically uh, um, encourage people to take part of one of the great um, um, great workshops that we that we do and um, um, that then um, 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 gets um, um, members or, or team members acquainted with the with the approach and again lots of learning by doing colleagues um, in know in a team that works on a particular guideline or something like that um, that's the approach but uh, again um, in order to be a methodologist, for guidelines, because grade only covers certain aspects of of, um, of grade, we've developed that in guide program that I mentioned a bit earlier. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we still have a lot of questions, and I promise that non questions will be lost. Uh, but we we are uh, time bound, and we just reached our time limit. Uh, so thank you a lot to all the presenters. Yeah. Can I just do one thing um, and provide that link? Sorry, um, Claudia, I think that's quite important. I know that you will be that yes, you will be definitely. providing this. Can I just put possibly that um, great uh, membership link in there before the you chat. close the webinar in the chat? Um, yeah, of course. And I will also use this time to show our social media handles as well for everybody interested in the future events to to join us. Thank you very much for all the all the nice comments and uh, compliments for the presentations. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.